I'm coming to you from Melbourne, um, also known as Nam, which is on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to their ancestors, past and present. Thank you all, also to the organisers of the seminar, the summit, sorry, and a special thanks for making it possible for me to present remotely. As much as I would love to be there with you in person in Barcelona, it's not possible this time. So two years ago at the first summit on new media Ar archiving, I spoke about one of the projects I'm leading at the moment called Archiving Australian Media Arts Towards a Method and a National Collection. This is a three year media arts history and preservation project, which is funded by the Australian Research Council under its linkage projects funding scheme. And here is the blurb. <clears throat> the project is a collaboration between major cultural institutions that have accepted the archives of important local media arts organisations, Experimenta Media Arts, Deluxe Media Arts, and the Australian Network for Art and Technology, known as ANAT, plus existing media arts collections at the Griffith University Art Museum and the State Library of South Australia. The project aims are here. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about what has come out of the second aim, namely our use of emulation as a service to emulate artworks from our chosen case studies. I'm going to be talking about the nodes, the target collections and domains of collections and investigators in a new Australian emulation network, which we've just received national grants funding to set up. So very exciting and very new, hot off the press. Over the past two years, we have been stabilizing and emulating media artworks using emulation as a service. For those of you who don't know, the emulation as a service platform developed by computer scientists at Freiburg University packages up open source emulators to provide access to obsolete computer environments, the hardware, operating systems, etc., on which legacy software and other complex digital artifacts can be emulated and accessed by users in a web browser. We've been using it in Australia in two projects, the Media Arts one I've mentioned, and also its sister project called Play It Again, preserving Australian video game history of the 1990s. And it's proven to be a very valuable tool for rendering the complex digital artifacts we're working with, 1990s games and 1980s and 90s digital media art. As part of our research protocol, in the Media Arts Project, we've been interviewing artists and demonstrating their emulated artworks to them, and they're pretty impressed. Funding from the Sloan and Mellon Foundations to Yale University has enabled a networked version of the platform to be developed over the last few, few years called EASY, Emulation as a Service Infrastructure. EASY delivers a scalable emulation service. In the US, many of you would know, it links libraries with born digital collections into a decentralized network where they can not only emulate content in-house, but also share images of utility software and pre-configured legacy environments with other library nodes. For instance, if a manuscript in one library requires an environment of Word 7 running in Windows 95, an administrator can search for and download the environment someone else has already configured, saving time and resources. <clears throat> Currently, we have Easy running in Google Australia Cloud. We are a participant in the US hosted node trial being run by the Software Preservation Network, but we found that lag times across the Pacific Ocean were too great for the service to be usable in Australia. The Google Australia Cloud installation is currently being used at ACME, the Australian Centre for the Moving Image and it enables visitors to play vintage games on their own devices when they connect to Acme's Wi-Fi. I've got a short two minute um, video demo of one of the media artworks being started up in Easy, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. So this is um, John Collette's 30 Words for the City. And what we're looking at here is the Easy backend. So this is a web browser, essentially that um, administrators would uh, go in and use uh, to configure an environment and then um, it plays the, the artifact. So in this case, it's booting up OS 9 and it takes about as long as it did back in the day. 
and then there's the disk in the virtual disk drive. Okay, so if you were um, seeing that as a researcher going into an archive to use it, you would not be seeing the um, easy interface around it. You would just be seeing the window that's playing the, the artwork and then be able to interact with it within that window. That is the emulation session. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea what I'm talking about if you're not familiar with um, the platform. Okay, <clears throat> whoops, keep going. Okay, so the opportunity here is that complex born digital artifacts are inaccessible currently without legacy environments to operate in. The Easy platform provides a way to build such legacy environments and share them with others in the network. Sharing of preserved software between libraries and archives as, as that, that is um, defined in the Copyright Act in Australia is legal for research purposes under Australian law. And that is um, due to the research exception in section 113J. Few people though at the moment in universities or in GLAM institutions have the skills and the know-how to do this. There's a need for training. There's a need for um, people learning how to do this and getting comfortable with it and familiar. Um, Arnet, uh, which you can see their logo up the top right, stands for Australia's Academic and Research Network, have been a partner of ours on the GAMES linkage project where we've been evaluating EASE and now EASY. And they're keen to offer EASY as a service to subscribers. So Arnet uh, runs the internet between universities in Australia and many cultural institutions. So they're quite a unique organisation. So I'm gonna talk uh, now a little about uh, the participants. Um, we have uh, a whole lot of universities here on the slide and a whole lot of GLAM institutions and I've grouped them um, by uh, city on the right hand side so you can see the different um, locations. Um, in March 2021 I put together a consortium of university researchers and GLAM institutions and university archives and we applied for infrastructure funding to build an Australian net emulation network. And we heard just before Christmas that it, we had been um, successful with this. So we've been awarded 751,000 Australian dollars um, and partners are contributing uh, some cash to that as well. And then there's an in-kind budget. Uh, if somebody wants to ask about the money in q and I can explain how it works. Uh, we're fortunate to be working closely with key international partners notably uh, the US install installation of EASY uh, via the Software Preservation Network and Yale University, as well as um, some of the other nodes on the US EASY network, like Cornell, and OpenSLX, of course, in Germany, the support company for the emulation as a service platform. So this will be a major national facility for, with 15 nodes across six cities and states. In reality, it's gonna be more than that, because some partners um, have offices in each state. For instance, IATSIS is the Australian Institute for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, um, and they are around the country. 
as our national archives who are not in the list because they're not part of our network. They will be running their own network though. So there will be some uh, sharing going on there. These are very different organisations, <clears throat> just to state the obvious, but they all have born digital assets that need emulation in order to be accessible. Um, and I suppose I, I really took the urging from, I think it was the Vancouver Declaration, very much to heart, uh, UNESCO's Memory of the World, um, Vancouver Declaration, some years back, to get people who don't usually talk to each other talking. So there's a common set of interests here that means that it makes sense to build a grand consortium, which is what we've done. So what the new project entails? Well, here's the blurb. Um, media arts are part of this project, but it's broader than media arts. We're also targeting design and architecture. We're gonna be building an easy network, likely on servers run by Rnet with overflow cloud provision. And specifically, we aim to stabilize at-risk media arts and similar born digital cultural artifacts, deliver access to born digital cultural and artistic artifacts to researchers over an easy network, and importantly, I think, de develop a community of practice for software preservation in Australia, building skill sets and confidence in preserving and emulating digital artifacts. The scope of our activities um, is going to include you know, procuring and building the network, purchasing equipment and getting it out um, and training people in how to make disk images. There are people are at very different stages across these different institutions. Some people are completely au fait with how to do this and other people are really at the beginning of their journey. So um, we're going to uh, be running a community of practice, uh, setting that up and, uh, and you know, walking people through uh, how to do some of these things that they might not know how to do, as well as training in building legacy environments. Um, and we have a whole swag of different archives of utility software that we'll be having access to, including from the Australian Computer Museum Society, um, to image uh, a whole lot of utility software and get it into easy so that environments can be built and shared. Okay, to talk a little bit about um, the different domains across which uh, we're going to be um, stabilizing artifacts. They cover media arts, but also there's a strong emphasis on some important architecture and industrial design collections here in Australia. Games and apps are another domain. AR, VR, and some web and pre-web networking. And on the right there, I've pasted the list of investigators um, chief investigators are typically researchers at universities and partner investigators are coming from the other affiliated organisations. So down the bottom, for instance, uh, Dr. Barbara Lemon is coming from NASLA, the National and State Libraries of, now it's Australasia, um, which is really wonderful. We've got three um, member libraries participating uh, from Queensland, Western Australia and um, New South Wales, as well as um, an agreement to uh, access some titles from the National Library of Australia's software collection. So it's really bringing together a whole lot of the assets um, that up to this point have been really um, not well joined up. And I think this is, a, um, this is something, this is the beginning of starting to join things up in a bit more of a cohesive way. Okay, <clears throat> so access to the above mentioned content uh, the media arts, architecture, design, et cetera, content is going to enable chief investigators and their teams to lead genuinely transformational research in born digital cultural histories across the domains. And it's important to note that there's not a one-to-one -one connection between collections, domains and researchers. It is much messier than that. <laughs> it's perhaps more rhizomatic. Um, and, and the project is definitely underpinning a conception of collections as distributed. Um, just as a distributed national collection of digital media arts archives is coming together in the media arts um, project that I started out um, telling you about. Um, it also makes sense to characterise other collections that we're going to be dealing with in this way. And across a, a country the size of Australia, um, I think it's really the only way to start thinking about uh, born digital collections. <clears throat> 
um, and accessing them. So rather than thinking about the star power of one well-endowed collection, the holdings of one organisation here provide context for others. Um, even the holdings of a small organisation can valuably add to larger collections, and we've seen that in the Media Arts Project. Finally, a decentralised network of organisations and collections is precisely what the Emulation as a Service Infrastructure platform has been built to service. And we are hoping that in future, with proposed legislative amendments, it might be possible to also offer off-site access to emulated artefacts, and perhaps even in time outside of national boundaries. This would truly realise the promise of distributed collections and offer real access choices to researchers at a time when, you know, jumping on a plane to go to the archive on the other side of the world is becoming less and less possible. All right, to finish up, um, we're going to be building a technical and human network. That is our conception of infrastructure and it, it entails both. A community of practice is going to help build confidence, um, not just that uh, collecting organisations can um, offer their existing collections um, and make them available to researchers, but it is also going to build confidence, I think, um, in the now about born digital collecting going forward. There's been a reticence because people haven't um, known how they're going to make born digital content accessible. Access to content is, I think, going to really enable CIs, chief investigators to lead research. It's pretty, pretty startling across these five domains. And this inf infrastructure, it's important to know, is about the future as much of, as the past. You know, when we were workshopping this proposal, uh, people were saying, you know, virtual reality works are becoming um, inaccessible or difficult to access within the space of a PhD, you know, across a three year time span, um, the software updates have uh, rendered um, work completed as little as three years ago, really, really difficult to access. So, you know, we need to future proof what we're doing now as much as being able to access uh, historic content from the past. And of course, you know, contemporary artifacts are not going to stop being digital. Um, we're, we're, we're still seeing so much coming out that um, is going to need appropriate computing environments to run in in the future. So I will end there. Thank you. I'm really happy to answer questions you may have now or later. Uh, so please reach out, there's my email and the full paper is in the proceedings. Thanks so much. Are there any questions for Melanie? Yes. I'm going to bring this mic around so that she can hear you. Hey, Melanie, it's Deborah here from the Powerhouse. Yeah. Hey, Deborah. <laughs> okay. um, I want to make the point that um, from a cultural institution's perspective, partner investigators rather than just CIs, um, in regards to thinking through how you would activate these archives in a cultural institution is potentially um, more in the ongoing practice of the PIs rather than the CIs. So I've got my mask on, hang on to it. Mask make me breathless. Sorry. Um, I wanted to make the point that partner investigators on these large grants has um, more of an ongoing practice in relation to how to day by day bring those archives into a collective public experience. Whereas the CIs, I would argue, um, those research practices will have a limited impact. And I'd like to see a way in which there's a tighter binding 
between chief investigators and partner investigators in these large scale um, archival projects. Would you like to comment? Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, Deborah and I have had this discussion before. Um, the uh, Research Council has its um, methods of evaluating research proposals. And so um, I needed to put a narrative together uh, that was going to be convincing as to how chief investigators were going to use these archives for research. Um, so that's why it's written the way it's written. Um, I, I don't think there's a, it's not a competition between who's going to use them the most or who's going to um, um, activate them. Of course, they're going to have um, benefits internally within cultural institutions as well. I, I don't think there's any argument there. I think we're on the same page. Well, thank you, Melanie. We're going to start our next talk. So let's give her a big hand. Okay. Uh, yours is this one? This one? Online, uh, we don't have anyone yet. Ah, uh, okay, then, then, we'll, we'll, then I will present it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hi, hi, everybody. If yeah, if uh, my student is not online, then I, I will present. That's okay. Uh, my name is uh, Barbara Guglielmo, and um, uh, I am from uh, Computational Media and Arts, uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology at uh, Guangzhou. And um, the title of our uh, paper is The Future of Art Museums in the Digital Age Using Virtual Reality for Archiving uh, Purposes. Uh, well, I think uh, there, is, uh, there is no uh, question that uh, archives are, are important and uh, uh, vital for, for uh, heritage and preserving uh, our culture. And uh, maybe the beginning uh, uh, of the uh, presentation title in the digital age sounds like uh, a bit uh, cliche because we are in the digital age already for, for a long time. Uh, but surprisingly, uh, when, when pandemic hit and all the museums had to close uh, their physical doors, then there was um, silence uh, for, for some time and then institutions realized that uh, they have to go digital and uh, expand beyond the, the physical uh, space. And they were kind of extremely uh, busy, including also uh, uh, galleries and festivals. Uh, to digitalize the content, digitalize also the space and the artifacts and the physical works and also digital works. Uh, so when uh, maybe it was the beginning of, of, the, of the web development, then, then the website was the thing and then it was forgotten. Then with the pandemic, it was again uh, the, the topic and, and actually really interesting um, uh, kind of programs uh, emerge uh, during these two years. And for instance, um, just to give you uh, some examples, it's a recent program by M Plus, it's a museum in Hong Kong, watch and chill, um, uh, stream art to your home. So uh, everything should, should be kind of uh, consum consumable, like on distance and, and from homes, but of course, the question is like how engaging, how immersive it is, how uh, exact are the, the exhibits and, and how to get kind of as close or even better experience of, of museum or the show uh, on, on remotely. And uh, yeah, there were a lot of launches of uh, online conferences and, and talks. And of course, there is also a participation is, is an issue. So. Uh, 
uh, are we only like consumers of digital content or, or, or the audience could also uh, uh, participate in, in certain uh, uh, products. Uh, so come to the next uh, second part of the title of uh, our paper, um, uh, the VR, and then again, like uh, if uh, most of you who comes from media art, like VR is, is nothing new. Uh, we, we know works from, from early uh, 90s, uh, but uh, now it's uh, reached the consumers. So it's reached our um, shop, uh, uh, shop windows and so on so it's it's kind of a tabletop uh, technology now and the museums uh, extensively uh, start to use uh, the vr technology and it's uh, reliable so um, people are not afraid of it and it's a perfect time to explore what kind of uh, possibilities it can have also uh, for for the archives um, so now uh, probably uh, uh, kind of uh, ev our everyday tools uh, when we talk about uh, research in uh, media art. Ah, sorry. <laughs> uh, research in media art, then, uh, uh, then, um, uh, then we uh, uh, we definitely know Ars Electronica, uh, Archive, and Ada, uh, which are, are great tools, uh, but. Um, uh, what about uh, immersive uh, installations or even the shows, exhibitions, like uh, we don't have um, the experience there, so mostly it's a documentation via uh, photo, video uh, and, and texts and hyperlinks, uh, so it's, uh, uh, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to get the idea of, uh, of uh, 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 maybe iconic uh, show uh, which was uh, which was up somewhere, or also uh, installation um, or VR piece, why not? And another aspect, uh, also, this uh, 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 kind of maybe rethinking a bit the archives is uh, like, what about the uh, wider audience? Uh, can we? Uh, it's it's let's say the the navigation and the knowledge there is very kind of uh, specific so if we want to open up uh, the archives also for wider audience then definitely like more uh, immersive uh, environments uh, uh, with, we need to think more about the immersive environments so uh, Zay is also here I don't know if uh, you want to uh, uh, take over and say a couple of uh, words uh, yes, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me uh, take in charge this part. So we raised up the question. So what if archive, uh, our works can be experienced in VR or and would be uh, a reasonability uh, to costly to achieve? Uh, so can you turn yeah. to the next page? Uh, well, uh, what we also noticed during um, uh, the pandemic is the appearance of uh, VR to tours, uh, like the virtual tours, uh, where then the physical space was recreated in the virtual space, and the audience could have a feeling that without being physically there, they, they have been uh, in the exhibition on the on the show and also um, uh, the details like uh, arrangements of the exhibits or, or certain kind of storyline uh, like it actually it gives also to to, uh, to the curators uh, uh, the maybe the influence or the word or also uh, the ex um, well we talked recently about uh, a few presentation before about embodied uh, archives like it's also maybe uh, embodied um, experience in a way that you can you can be in the space and and this is kind of uh, quite uh, trendy uh, to have these uh, virtual uh, tours yeah for for this part and we did a literature review about like existing exhibition left side like the vr conducted exhibition which happened in 2019 and 2018 which is really successful uh, and uh, the first is uh, Mona Lisa Beyond Glass, a VR exhibition. The second one is a 3D modeling of artist studio, 
and the audience can really get into the audience studio to experience when the artist is making the painting. So right side is uh, VR as the artist uh, two keys for helping, uh, help, helping the artist to making their own artwork. And the top one is a VR crimson by the Nico Copper. And the bottom left side is a famous artwork, uh, Real Violence. And I really go to that space to see the exhibition in the Whitney Museum, which is a really good, a good artwork and by George Wolfson. And right side is the VR like Pokemon Go like installation uh, in the Liverpool venue and by uh, Era Chin. Uh, which is a really good artist to help her uh, to help the uh, we are artists to creating artwork. Mm -hmm. So for uh, this part, and there are a lot of like platform to help the museum and the gallery to uh, use in the online archiving. Uh, so this is uh, no, online archiving from the store uh, modern art museum, modern uh, contemporary art museum. Uh, which is uh, one uh, online open source and the entire exhibition which is really good looks really good and uh, video organization navigation orientation and but like for professional audience uh, for non-professional audience which is really also friendly and the people can take like the vr tour and have a really good experience with the physical space and but like there also have a limitation. So for example, like the current uh, VR tour, such as this online uh, tour, uh, cannot offer the metadata tagging. So which is really hard for some for some general audience to searching for specific artists or specific artwork. So we try to um, summarize uh, the pros and cons of VR technology in the context of archives. So for this part, and we start to consider about like, uh, if we definitely use VR as the archiving, so what is the uh, uh, pros? And first we are thinking about like a lot of museum or galleries start to use in that, whatever is good or not, this is really popular. And second one is the VR archiving can exact it to replace the exhibition setting up and the ten when the artwork was exhibited in the physical space, which is really good, especially for the digital age. And even like we are in the age of uh, metaverse right now, a lot of like uh, digital artworks was really good for exhibiting the physical space and how can we uh, input, put that into VR space. And also time and locations doesn't matter. And uh, even like uh, not everyone has their own VR equipment and the people can still use in like a computer screen to visiting uh, the online archiving in the VR platform in every video and every time. And also uh, it's really good for installation art and which is uh, gives the audience more immersive view in the VR sense. And also like VR archiving can uh, contain the really hu huge collections for the uh, big museum, such as like MoMA or like Whitney or like Guggenheim. And we are easily can see on their website, they have really huge collections, like museum collections, but not every piece of the, like really good artworks can show in the online archive. So, and also like um, the next part is in the future, maybe like we are, uh, actually, right now we are already have some like touch and haptic feedback, uh, which is powered by really emerging technology. But right now, like uh, the online archiving can also apply some like touch and haptic feedback, especially good for, for interactive art. And also like VR art can be built in the original format and such as the uh, artwork we are talking about in previous slides. Uh, and also we are can use in the digital archive, especially for some uh, general audience beyond the exporter. And also like it, it has a really good potential in education and curatorial programs. So, and also even like VR has a lot of really good potential in the future use for archiving, but uh, it's also have a lot of limitation and challenge. And for example, the expensive equipment, 
uh, to be honest, like the, the equipment of the VR lens is not that expensive right now, uh, but only for the young people. And even for the old generation, maybe they think like spend 200 bucks by a lens, VR lens, which is really expensive. So it also can raise another question as like, the elderly people, it's really hard to use uh, VR technologies because when you use that, you need a lot of like starting setup and which we need some like online tutorial like for the elderly people. And also uh, to use VR to maintain uh, archiving is a kind of a labor and cost intensive process, especially at the start, you spend a lot of money to doing that. And like your also need to spend much money and time to re retain the archive data because you need to uh, go to that like data to fix the data um, error every every time every day and it's uh, which uh, spend a lot of money and time and also the existed 3d torque uh, applications such like like google art and culture or the matterport which is a really good platform but to be honest like Mm, some of the people cannot really, some uh, author of the people cannot really get access to the source file. So, which is really a uh, limitation, has a limitation for doing this kind of ar archiving purpose. Yes. Okay, and now uh, we are already in the conclusion. So, uh, VR archives are definitely not meant to, to replace. Uh, uh, the physical exhibitions or or existing uh, archives, but uh, rather uh, they are uh, meant or or their role can be more in uh, in documenting documenting uh, the exhibitions uh, and the and the immersive feelings uh, which which are aimed to forward uh, to be forwarded in the uh, exhibitions and also as uh, as archiving of uh, of the exhibitions uh, setup and arrangements, and uh, well, uh, the VR uh, technology uh, already is is uh, is in commercial hands, so to say. Uh, there are, for instance, Google Arts and Culture and Matterport, uh, but uh, one needs to be careful with these tools because they are uh, proprietary. Uh, uh, softwares and platforms which uh, uh, which are also uh, limiting us in uh, in archiving um, uh, what what needs to be archived uh, in a, in the long run. Um, so, for instance, the previous uh, talk talk uh, talked about emulation, and it's it's uh, it's very good that they are creating their own emulation server rather than relying on some uh, commercial one. Uh, uh, but talking about uh, VR tools is, is definitely maybe, as, as I told, it's not the replacement, uh, but for the audience who couldn't be there or, or couldn't, couldn't go or you want to re-look re exhibition from, I don't know, maybe 20 years from, from now, it, it might be uh, possible. Uh, and... Uh, uh, yeah, and, and again, uh, as we mentioned before, uh, this uh, allows uh, VR archives might uh, allow to uh, expand uh, the audience uh, range. So it's not only uh, the experts, but also the wider audience. And, and then, you know, it's more like not uh, searching for information, but maybe just like uh, exploring uh, the information and, and, and the archive in a different way. And it's definitely uh, very much uh, suitable for, for VR works and also uh, installations. Uh, maybe we need to think uh, it's, uh, it's not, let's say, if we talk about VR work, which is, uh, uh, which is let's say, uh, code-based, not video-based, maybe it needs to be then, uh, or an interactive, maybe then needs to be replaced by the videos and so on. So it's uh, kind of a bigger uh, discussion here. Because yeah, it's 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 kind of easier to preserve, definitely. Uh, yes, and uh, that's it. I think from from uh, our side. If there are any questions, I think we were on time. <laughs> yeah.
you have a question through the chat. Oh, okay. I just can't see it. Oh, yeah, maybe I can. Okay. Can you see it on your table? Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, here it is. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, can you comment on uh, the interfaces API regarding archiving? I wonder if materials are then only there in terms of encapsulated or can you export content from the environment also to keep? Uh, 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 yes, I mean, it's... Uh, 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 this is a this is a thing with uh, for instance with a uh, with a Matterport uh, it, it doesn't allow you to export uh, uh, artifacts so to say <laughs> it even doesn't allow you um, to get the three D three D model of the space so that's why we need to be very uh, careful with this uh, commercial solutions because. Uh, um their uh, kind of mission is more profit oriented uh, rather than preservation oriented so uh, uh, we also tried to do kind of one project with matterport uh, uh, whether to scan the physical space and then use this uh, uh, 3d um, environment for for kind of outside of matterport uh, uh, software and it was uh, it resulted uh, at least for us uh, impossible so it's it's kind of a quite uh, quite closed environment but uh, nevertheless it's very much uh, used by uh, worldwide by many uh, art institutions uh, because it's really easily allows you to kind of put uh, documentation of the exhibition uh, online and uh, and I don't know what uh, if we talk about uh, Matterport, uh, then then uh, this would be about this. But uh, about other uh, interfaces, uh, well, it's uh, it's more more the more the uh, question of of development, uh, right? So it's uh, if we are talking about like. Uh, going beyond visual ones, uh, also the haptic ones, and so on. So it's, uh, um, yeah, it becomes uh, more more complex, but not uh, impossible if, uh, if we can integrate, for instance, the suits and gloves and and so on. Uh, but again, they are dependent on <laughs> different interfaces and APIs, which uh, makes. Uh, uh, makes makes archiving uh, more uh, more complex. Uh, that's why I was also in the end uh, referring that maybe interactive uh, installations which could be archived uh, through uh, VR technology maybe needs need to be replaced by by uh, multi-channel uh, videos instead. I mean, in, in the end, it's like how much. Uh, how much uh, technical uh, development uh, one wants uh, wants to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Thank you from Hong Kong. Um, I think these last two lectures were uh, inspiring. Um, not to say that the others were not, but these two, Melanie and me and Farvaras. Um, make me feel that we're making progress and that it's very important that we have a summit where these initiatives come together. So um, whoever wants to organize next year's summit, um, tell me. Um, <laughs> we have a short break now and we have to be back here exactly at 12. So look at your watch or your phone and um, get back here by 12. Thank you.
Hello. Hey, yes, it's working. Can you try really yes, quickly? Yes. Because really, we really have a few minutes. To, can you hear me? Can, yes. Can you share, please, your screen and share your presentation? What you want to try? Because we really yeah. have not even 10 minutes to do it. Yeah. Um, so you have to really be quick. Um. And also, if you can turn on the camera so we can see you and check that everything yeah. working properly. Thank you. Um, start video. We will introduce ourselves. Uh -huh. Okay, then we'll just tell us when to begin. So, okay. Whenever you so put more stress on us. Okay, hello everybody. Um, we're honored to and delighted to be here, part of this wonderful organization. We will introduce ourselves very quickly because we have only uh, 15 minutes of time. I am Saad Chukartus. Um, by the way, we're from Istanbul, both coming from this uh, Sabancı University. Um, indeed, I was the vice chair for the IC in 2011, way back. Um, it's great to be back in ICA again. And um, I also would like to point um, the audience interest into this book very quickly. Um, just a small ad, uh, Technological Art Preservation. I'm one of the editors of the book. I'm gonna hand it around so that you can you can look, look inside. So I'm running this um, research project called Technological Art Preservation, which is headed by the university. Uh, indeed, the cover will be a nice um, link to our presentation. The photo that you're about to see is, has been photographed by the um, author, the photographer, I called multimedia artist called Teoman Madra, and um, we're going to talk about his archive. Okay, so then th that was kind of like a sign to the next thing on our agenda. So, um, right next to me, yes, yes, please. Right next to me, uh, Begum, uh, she's doing her master's degree, first year is about to, to, to finish. And this project was uh, my kind of like artistic investigation, exploration about what has happened before um, 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 my generation. I'm an artist working heavily, intensively doing things with technology. Uh, so then Begum joined in. So she's also contributing to this uh, research. So better, uh, we should move on. So the, the manuscript that we're about to present stands as a, it's, it's, it's indeed the, the first presentation, the debut academic dissemination of the intensive archiving process of the Turkish multimedia artist Teoman Matra, who created multimedia artworks between 1960s and 2000s. The cataloging process and the methodologies implemented for descriptive analysis have, will be discussed in detail. 
So as I said, 15 minutes of time, very short for our presentation, but I will be delighted to hear more comments. If you can stop us and, and, and talk, we'll be uh, very happy to, to go into the further details. But to give you an insight about his career, he was born in 1931. He's a living artist. He's still alive. He went to United States in the 50s to study his undergraduate education, but his interest in contemporary art and avant-garde jazz music grew during the edu his education in California and New York between 50s and 54s. In 55, he bought his first photographic camera, Volk Lander, little B, from a major during his military service in Turkey, and he started shooting photographs, experimental uh, photographies. And in his own words, he defines himself as a fluxus artist, literally after 1963, 62. Thanks to this camera that allows for imposing one after the other, I'm going to show you some of his works. And he has been doing lots of collaborations with music art, uh, uh, music composers in, in the in the past. Uh, on your right hand side, I think we're blocking a few, but you might see some of his experimental photography works. He also exhibited his pieces uh, as far in, in mainly in Europe as well. During the 70s, he tried to interact with multiple senses with light music and a movement in the multimedia shows he organized and called them as anesthesias. And I'm here about to present you one of the, the works he did in the 80s, because in the 80s, he owns a computer called Amiga. I, I bet you are familiar with the name. And then he created all these amazing works back then. Uh, and I love this video, especially because you can see that you're, he's getting a lot of like error messages, not enough memory for operation, but he still tries on. And um, another nice presentation about his works in the past in the 80s. This is kind of like showing you the making of it, because as you can see, he's in between like mixing analog and the digital, because this, there's a feedback loop of an analog capture from a TV which is creating the background and he's using, I think, the same app, the Dalix Paint, to create all the generative uh, images on top, layering. So as an artist, he was unknown for, for a long time. His, his works were on, on the dust, thick dust left somewhere. And as I said, my personal investigation has brought me his name and then I um, went and then talked to his, his uh, wife, and then I was pointed to an archive, which has never been archived before. And she told me there are a couple of bunch of CDs, but indeed not bunch of like thousands of CDs, fifteen thousands of the other negatives, and like four hundred thousands of videos. They all have been captured and digitized by myself, um, indeed. So they're in good hands and safe. Uh, safe. Uh, in, um, in the early today, we had the presentation from the map. I think they are in kind of like a consultation um, uh, resolution, but which is about to be uh, going into more um, um, detailed um, resolutions because um, this archiving process is about to become an exhibition in the very near future. Um, and we're going to talk about our preservation strategy. Um, the first one is the um, the initial step of archiving the, the Tema Madra works for indeed uh, was attempted in January 2021, a year ago, he, in his hometown Naivolik. The existing materials were in like VHS, Betamax, negatives and prints and, and all sorts of analog media and also digital floppies and such. Several digitization processes have been implemented with different techniques due to varying media necessities. Would you like to take on from me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, due to the vastness of Madras archive, we started by exploring the content of the materials at hand at first. As we have been getting familiar with the archive, we asked the question of what am I cataloging as recommended in the cultural, uh, cataloging cultural objects manual. Firstly, I would like to indicate that we include only the archival process of the static images and the linear temporal multimedia works within the scope of this paper, but there is much more than that in the archive. And uh, secondly, Madras archive doesn't solely include his artistic creations, but many artworks owned by other artists and also his commercial, commercial productions exist within the scope of his archive. 
So you can see an example documentation of Ben Patterson's fluxes happening that was filmed by Madras. So Ben Patterson here is conducting a bunch of uh, apple eaters, as you can see. That was super unexpected that while we were digitizing all the material, we realized that he was the man with the moving camera. Um, so he was um, shooting all these recordings. So they, they are extremely important to, to, um, uh, to represent an archive of the, 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 um, the art scene in the 90s of, of the Turkish contemporary scene. Because of that importance, we didn't eliminate these kinds of recordings from the archive. We found them valuable for the sake of continuity and historicity. Uh, rather, the dual nature of the recordings, whether it, the possibility of being the documentary or artwork in itself, was taken into account while building the field database for cataloging. Mm -hmm. Next again. And after we agreed on what to be cataloged, we started to analyze the data standards starting from the data structure. Uh, starting for the data structure, we chose CDWS schema because of its uh, allowance for integration data to other system and also its precision with it, it is comprehensive categories for cataloging. After that, for the data values, we decided to use the art and architecture thesaurus by the Getty Research Institute. And lastly, for the data contact, we are following cataloging cultural objects manual, as I mentioned before. And as an example, uh, we start to, to cataloging with the negatives once we establish our framework and build our database. Uh, you can see an exa example image from Mozart's archive on the slide alongside with its descriptive identifiers. We firstly indicate the file type included in the database, which is an image in that case, followed by the name of the digital image file. The titles of artworks remained untitled, followed by consecutive index numbering, since there are no specific names given by the artist himself in most of the cases. The description is provided as light games, since Madra describes these kind of photography series as such. The format of the original analog media is dianegative and the medium is specified as photography. In the subject field, we only distinguish between whether a record is an artwork or documentary. Uh, however, as it will be discussed in the future work later, it will be enhanced more once we build our subject tree, in other words, the classification schema. Uh, and the conservation history is none since no effort was put for the sake of preserving Madras work until such Carter initiated this uh, preserving his archive project. And the related textual references field remains unknown, unknown for now for all the records because uh, while we are expanding our database by, by adding the records of the work, we are also working on gathering and classifying the written documents as well. These, the, these documents include exhibition catalogs, artist statements, or newspaper clippings, and the necessary references will be provided once we are done with our research, research on these written documents as well. And for the video recordings, the examination step of video recordings, the digitized ver versions of Betamax Media use and exactly required further feedback from us. Uh, this, because the, each video file doesn't in, only contain a single record, but many due to the user's intention to fill the memory of analog media. That being the case, we aim to cut each video file into multiple coherent pieces concerning the artist's intention of creation. In general, the partition oper operation was performed based on the empty tape dis displays in between the video records. If not so, the pieces were arranged according to the content of the scenes, uh, the, their visual style or the musical compositions the artist arranged. The obtained pieces were uploaded to the previous ob obtained cloud service while keeping them together in the same directory with the original recording untouched. And you can see an example from our uh, field database and you can see our metadata element set. As you can see from the table, 
We named the partition files by adding consecutive numbering at the end of the original file name. The title of the work remained un untitled, as in the photograph, unless there is a specific naming done by, done by the artist within the scope of the video recordings. Descriptions are also provided in line with the content of the video, the information given within the scope of them, and also with the help of the chosen words from initially decided tag cloud, such as geometric art, generative art, etc., as we decided on at the very beginning of our research project. Um, I think we can continue with the future work, what will be done in the future as a, is in the continuation of this project. Firstly, the works of Temo Madra produced with the iPad in the 2000s, which he started to use frequently in the last stages of his art, active artistic production, production will be examined and will be added to the database by following the previously explained structure of cataloging. After we examine all the digital media, the subject tree, the, in other words, the classification scheme will be constructed following the content of the whole Temo Madra archive, since it will be fully observed at the end. While doing so, the art and architecture thesis used by Getty Research Institute will be the guiding light. In that stage, the poly hierarchical approach will be taken so that the same subcategory will be accessible under various categories. We believe that this approach will provide more flexibility in the categorization of a such digital environment with its allowance for several rules that users can follow. It can be suggested that our cataloging process is biased in a sense that it depends on our judgment while providing descriptions for the work while partitioning the video files and etc. and classifying them according to our judgment. And also, as we have seen in the examples provided, there are missing fields in identifiers due to the lack of information. To solve both issues, one minute left. We will arrange gatherings with whom may be concerned, such as artists Madra was collaborating with creators, art critics of the time, and musicians, so that in such gatherings, the cataloging records will be open to discussion and hopefully missing gaps will be fulfilled and more unbiased approach will be taken regarding Madra's words. Yes, you can see there are thousands of words to be done. <laughs> um, one, one thing to be on our hot agenda is uh, an exhibition is um, soon coming. That is to say all these works um, under the archive, archive has to be coming in front of the, the audience and hopefully we will get more attention to our um, project. Thank you. We have time for questions, I wonder. If not, then we will be available around. Yeah. You can ask your questions during the, the break. We'll have a, we have lots of breaks. Jose, you want to get set up? Um, Jose here? Is Jose here? Oh, there you are. Go ahead and set up right there. Is this one right? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Jose Bertedo. Uh, I have two partners, uh, uh, professors of the University of Malaga. They are uh, Alonso Paredo and uh, Carlos Florido. We are three, you know, from the University of Malaga. Uh, the, the title of our proposal uh, refers to a field of research of current relevance. It's because the problem of the of digital archiving of contemporary artworks of media and data art. This project focuses on two solid lines of, of research. On the one hand, the design of curatorial strategies for archiving artwork developed in media and data art. On the other hand, uh, we consider that the artistic trends included in these two fields share the problem of obsolescence due to rapid technological uh, advancement. 
In this way, we present uh, a working progress uh, um, project that named is uh, Medipol. It proposes a, a virtual space to take in both uh, the programming code with which this work are developed and the registers uh, generated for their uh, development, both technical and conceptual. Um, Uh, we believe in the relevance of audiovisual artistic production uh, and its exhibition and dissemination as influ influential uh, knowledge. I am a um, uh, programmer artist and I think about uh, this problematic uh, thing uh, for future academy. Uh, I, I, I so we believe in the relevance of audiovisual artistic production and, and its exhibition and dissemination as influential knowledge source. Okay, um, so in this way, uh, we confront the complexity of contemporary arti artistic practice. There is a need to provide society with multidisciplinary tools. The aim of this is to encourage understanding of new audiovisual, audiovisual uh, languages. We use the concept of media libraries as resource centers designed to meet the academic communities, cultural, educational, or research needs. Artistic practices around media and data art have become critical element elements at the intersection of art, science, and technology. There is a risk that threatens these creative tendencies, such as quick technological obsolescence, which implies, among other things, uh, the impossibility of executing specific projects if the technologies with which they were created, created are no longer updated. I'm sorry. Uh, to face this problem, is, it is essential to develop innovative solutions to deal uh, with the collection of documentation, indexing and research of media art. For example, the creation of up-to-date archiving policies. Time. <laughs> Our starting point is based on, on the need to attend to archiving contemporary artistic material developed in media and data art environments to create repositories of artistic work. We pay special attention to the results generated with creative programming code and the software, hardware and resources needed to visualize and compile the code with which they have been developed. On the other hand, we must attend in to, hit to this progressive incorporation of new generative and visualization, visualization languages using curatorial policies and methodologies. We consider, we consider this technical knowledge as a valuable tool for an artistic reading of our present. In this context, we propose designing and creating the media library, maybe Paul, for managing media and data at works, paying, paying, paying attention to the different formats for contents and tools. The objectives we set out for these proposals are as follows. The one is in this, this phase plans to virtualize and musealization of audiovisual artworks and the regulation and homologation to this time a repository of artistic production as a historical repository of media and data artworks. The idea of the Mimipol project begin 
begins as a space with a clear academic component for the reinforcement of artistic production. We conceptualize this by attending to the territories of otherness and territorialization with works that fall into the media and data art categories. Maybe Paul sees the policies of incorporation, acquisition, donation, and free access to a part of the collection with res restricted access to a scientific 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 database uh, open to uh, researchers uh, competence basis training actions will be proposed using generative audiovisual production tools to produce media and data art projects the workshops will be designed to introduce the tools and produce media and data art projects on the thematic strategies that characterize Mebipol. The interdisciplinary seminars will specialize in a range of visual programming languages. We have initiated a study to establish categories and typologies of software according to their creative use base based on the application in different innovative, innovative trends. Numerous creative programming tools can be found for the development of computational at work. Uh, in this older diagram it shows, we show some pieces of software organized by the typology typology of use in a hybrid creative environment. <clears throat> the multidisciplinary nature of this project and its relationship with digital technologies requires, re requires the creation of a mixed working group to address the media library's different needs. One of the leading agents for creating and managing the, the Mibipol database, database and the design of the storage architecture of the digital work described is the uh, character, character of computer engineer. engineer. This need will have to be supplemented by professionals uh, in web design it will be necessary to specify the format in which the digital material of the media library will be displayed. There are numerous methodological cases for classification or taxonomy of the terminology of these new media, languages and codes, aiming to contrast and categorize works developed develop in interdisciplinary artistic fields. These studies are based on definition and the technological components of new languages. Uh, Medipol is presented as a qualitative online repository formed by artistic projects that will be selected following uh, curatorial criteria and methodologies through different strategies. They, these are projects created in the workshops, open course, and own exhibition. The, the aim of to, is to offer free access to all documentation. Finally, uh, um, we show uh, the, the interaction parts of the maybe poll. One of the source of Mebipol will be formed by material developed, developed in workshops that different components of the research group uh, uh, will carry out. Uh, we will take the methodological uh, framework established by Harald uh, Seaman. He is one of the uh, key characters who helped understand how curatorial 
practice expanded and as an autonomous field from the 1916s. His contribution, sorry, his contributions make up uh, the cartography of curatorial practice. Simon describes his methodology as structure chaos. Medipol incorporates the experience of in, in developing uh, the structure of similar repositories in previous uh, research projects, such as Vormetur, uh, AEMA, or Medician. Medipol was, was, was born in a, uh, with a literary character with the idea of uh, covering different research needs. For this reason, uh, it is expected to create separate, separate access policies to the database, giving priori priority to research uh, projects. Cultural transmission, transmission uh, through events, scientific publications, or seminars is also contemplated. Regarding the, the project in, in uh, internationalization, Agreements are being, uh, being, being made, made with institutions such, such as the African Film Festival, uh, uh, the Federal Uni University of Rio Grande, and the Weissensee Kunsthochschule uh, in Berlin. At the present, uh, uh, different coordination meetings are taking place to understand how the parties involved work and assess data file uh, management and other documentation needs. Um, this is my presentation. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Any questions? No questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you too. Um, in the wherever you are, Juan and uh, Alonso. Okay, the next speaker will uh, announce itself. Sorry, I didn't look at the program. <laughs> Presentation here. We have a slight change right? in the schedule. Our chairman has yes. agreed to go now um, because our remote speaker is not there yet. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Thank you so much for uh, the possibility to introduce uh, the Expanded Animation Symposium. I am a professor at the University of Applied Sciences Upper Austria, very close to Linz, and I'm also um, the director of the AS Electronic Work Animation Festival. So this is a project a collaboration between AS Electronic Work and um, our university. So this paper discusses challenges and uh, proposals for archiving uh, such an uh, ambitious uh, symposium. And it also shows the collaboration with a huge archive and also with uh, an international partner. So first I will introduce the symposium. It's an annual event. We started uh, in 2013. This year we have uh, the 10th anniversary. So uh, in conjunction with uh, the pre-category computer animation, this symposium addresses uh, the fringe areas of digital animation and the intersection of animation and media arts. Of course, expanded animation has its roots in expanded cinema. And as at the first conferences at Ars Electronica discussing what is uh, media art, uh, we are doing similar structure. So like uh, experts, like 
Peter Weibel or um, Jin Yang Blood or some kind of BQ actually coined the expanded cinema, as you all know. Uh, we're doing a, a similar structure with uh, discussions, with screenings, uh, and uh, the symposium is under the umbrella of the Aspect Chronicle Animation Festival. So it's very broad activity with the pre forum, with the prize winners, etc. So it started as a very small event with uh, 10 speakers. It was designed as a unique event with the keynote speaker Susan Bucken. She just published uh, in 2013 uh, a pervasive animation, an anthology as well. Uh, and it was uh, at the first day of Aspect Chronicle. Uh, after two years, we had the possibility. So we started with mapping the unlimited landscape of animation. And after two years, it was uh, under the umbrella of uh, the Animation Festival. It extended uh, in conjunction with the pre forum. And uh, in 2020, of course, we switched to an online hybrid format. Uh, and uh, we started the collaboration with the University for uh, University for Creative Arts Farnham with uh, a, a new format with a more scientific format, synesthetic syntax with the code for paper. So three day event already. Um, the first uh, edition was uh, a hybrid version in Portland, uh, London and Linz. Uh, and we continued and this year we have uh, the title gesture of resistance. So uh, since 2013, we have featured uh, a lot of speakers. Uh, here are some statistics. And as you can see here, these three parts, uh, the, the main symposium, uh, the pre-forum, so that features three, four, five uh, winners in the category, and some aesthetic syntax. Uh, on the left side, right side, you see uh, the gender statistic. And this is also good to see that DRB is a balanced gender ratio already. So talking about uh, archiving such an uh, um, ambitious project, starting as a small event, now it's kind of a broad uh, activity under the big umbrella of uh, Azure Chronicle. Uh, we started with the website since uh, last year, we have uh, an online archive that you can see here. Uh, and this was quite important that we started uh, documenting the festival at the beginning. So uh, now we can go to the first uh, videos of the first ex ex uh, symposium. You see Vigil Wittrich uh, talking about his projects. Uh, and you see that uh, we put a lot of effort in producing the videos, uh, split screen with uh, graphics, etc. Uh, and of course, in collaboration with Asa de Kronika, we had the privilege to spread it also into as electronic archives so you find all the material that we have created uh, for instance the keynote by Rose Bond in 2020 is uh, in the subsection uh, talks and lectures but we also uh, featured uh, our videos on uh, Vimeo at the beginning uh, and uh, two, two years we are screaming uh, on YouTube uh, so we have a, a huge archive with a lot of videos uh, and since the beginning we have a collaboration with the local uh, television um, broadcaster and there's also uh, an archive so the videos are archived on three platforms and this is a class classical uh, archiving form of a symposium um, we published an anthology uh, summarizing the first uh, six editions and also this uh, um, anthology is um, um, yeah, reflecting the hybridity with uh, a section with sh short, uh, short and long papers, essays, but also a sec section of featuring uh, projects from Ars Electronica. So there are a lot of challenges. Uh, and one, of course, is uh, um, you have to document uh, such uh, events uh, uh, at, since the beginning. Uh, and fortunately, we can do this with our students with a lot of support of volunteers because uh, we have different venues every year there is a, a different venue and you can also see a very special venue the deep space uh, um, and it's of course a, a big problem how you uh, document uh, interactive performances for instance uh, um, uh, Mike Winkleman's uh, presentation of his 5000 every days and he made a, a live performance there 
Uh, video documentation is quite good, but of course it just gives them short insight. Um, so I will conclude, um, and I, this is my uh, conclusion uh, after 10 years. Uh, we started very early with uh, documenting everything uh, and with a broad strategy. So uh, in collaboration with the local television broadcaster, very traditional archive, uh, in conjunction with House Electronica's huge archive, this opens the door for a lot of collaborations as well. Uh, and continuing our documentation on the website with all the materials, with uh, um, texts, et cetera, and also thinking about uh, these classical forms of proceedings. Uh, uh, the synesthetic syntax uh, is now going into the third edition and there will be a proceeding next year. So that's a very simple conclusion. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you all very much. I'm sorry for the bad uh, uh, introduction. I always wonder where uh, Arts Electronica gets all its facilities from. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm always jealous, you know, Arts Electronica has money. Um, but maybe we will get sponsors someday. And the next speaker is, uh, they have the little slight problem is loading up this uh, page. Uh, it's Pedro Sipiani. He is an, an old timer at uh, ISEA. Um, he is uh, coming in from the remote. He's not there. They left the room. Everybody loves breaks, I guess. But how long? <laughs> yeah, well, boy, you know, if you get, you get in that, you don't go away too far, and otherwise. Um, let's say that what time is it now? Uh, one, one o'clock, thirteen hundred. Well, if, we, if we don't warn you that they start already, we will be here at one o'clock sharp. Thank you.
Okay, um, sorry for the delay. We have Petra here in the on the screen. Uh, welcome, Petra, and I will just give it to you. Thank you. Uh, I'm very sorry for this uh, short delay. Uh, today I will uh, try to present in 15 minutes uh, our paper VR as a function for archiving media arts. One example. The content of this presentation will be short introduction concept of uh, media art archiving via virtual reality, case study, and conclusions. The aims of this presentation are to show a new concept for the possible archiving and use of new media art in virtual reality, and to demonstrate the possibilities and shortcomings of this concept through one example, one case study. The goal of archiving media arts is to preserve works and information related to them, their public availability, as well as educational needs in the field of art. A small number of works are archived in libraries, museums, or on websites of artists or art associations, and data about them is mostly scarce and only the few can be viewed in their original form. Some of the media art works can be reinterpreting and transformed through VR technology and can be preserved, archived, and made available to wider audience. Currently, there is no platform for VR archiving of such performed, reinterpreted works. The existing mostly gaming platforms could be used for this purpose. In general, we are one step away from global change in the paradigm of media arts, which is noticeable by the fact that more and more authors are submitting their works in the form of NFTC. Archiving at the time of general change in the field of artistic activity has also been forced to adopt the new conditions. One of the more recently announced and increasingly notable is uh, the unstoppable concept of metaverse networking, where virtual reality will completely change previous experiences in creating, consuming, exchanging, and with that, the process of archiving new art. Archiving such works in a newly created context requires a accelerated adoption of solutions that will help preserve global production. Everything is changing quickly and it is necessary to look at the fields that have already been adopted, such as the field of video games. Platforms for VR games, for example, Steam VR, Oculus Store, etc., have already been created due to their immense commercial demand. Still, there are no platforms for archiving artistic VR works, and most of the works are either not widely available or are placed on the gaming platform. This is the basic starting point for 
uh, conceiving the current possibilities of archiving media art reinterpreted in virtual reality. The primary concept of VR archiving of media arts is based on four steps. First, selection of the art work that needs to be archived, preparation and adoption to VR archiving and accessibility to users. Here is the scheme of our concept for VR archive of new media art. The selected work should be digital, interactive, spatially defined and have enough data to be used for its direct introduction or adaptation to VR medium. The analysis of existing work and all its protocols related to functionality, media characteristics, duration, specifics, etc. This is the basis of the next phase of VR production, such as 3D modeling, creation of giving functions, programming, rendering, sound processing, etc. In this phase, the work is tested and, if necessary, corrected until a satisfactory version is created in relation to the to selected original work. The work prepared in this way is ready to be published on the VR archiving platform. This will be public available to libraries, museums, art association collectors, as well as to all interested individuals from all over the world, which will be able to access the work by approval or some compensations. Due to its historical and media significance and specificity, the work spiral of awards uh, uh, realized in 1998 was chosen as a case study of this archiving concept. This was an online writing performance performed from three locations by three authors in real time via the internet. The authors from the London, UK, uh, The Hague, the Netherlands, and Novi Sad, Serbia, send their textual narratives dedicated to one of the philosophers, Hanvash, Buber, and Berjaev, by email in a precisely defined time written to, to the recipient's address. It was an event called the Academy of Noble Skills, which took place on the slopes of uh, Sunny Valley of Ruska Gora near Novi Sad, Serbia. The building of the imaginary spiral of words begin with one word followed with a sentence, then by a paragraph, and end with a story. At the location, three actors performed the received the textual narratives in front of the audience. The analysis of the performance, performance protocol was in the first step for preparing the material for VR production. And here is the scheme of protocol analysis. And you can see three authors from three different uh, locations. And each of them choose one of philosopher. And uh, they uh, wrote uh, uh, words, sentences, paragraphs, and stories, and sent the, the, this uh, not textual narrative material uh, through internet to Academy of Noble Skills. At the Academy of Noble Skills, two actresses and one actor uh, present or play those textual narrative to audience and it became speech narrative. And in the field of spiral of words is uh, starting to build up one imaginary spiral of words. Documentation of uh, uh, the whole invent of the Academy of Noble Skills was published in a book, and that means that partly our project, Spiral of Words, is also archived in the form of textual uh, in, in a book. After the protocol analysis, the next step was uh, conditioned by the transformation of the concept defined in the original work and its preparation for VR production. The first step for VR production was the mathematical definition of the spiral path and partial appearance of word sentences, paragraphs, and stories. 
This was followed by programming in C-sharp language. After the first testing of the programming code in VR, the project was advanced to definition specific VR functionalities, such as the use of controllers, navigation, editing of selected words, sound signals, etc., by using the Unity engine and Audacity for sound effects. Testing followed, then corrections in code and functionality, then retesting. In the final phase, specific symbolic visual and sound effects were added for certain words, which is a direct influence and features that is close to the theatrical and performing arts, those outside of the VR on the theater stage. For the purpose of the archiving and accessibility of the fully prepared work, the project build was sent for verification to the Oculus App Lab. We chose Oculus uh, 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 store for archiving our project. And that's the reason why we send the build to verification to Oculus App Lab. Here is a scheme of time flow from protocol analysis and production of our video work. And uh, it's several steps and uh, it's a mathematical definition, uh, programming, uh, VR functionality, sound effects, etc., and then testing, retesting and sending this uh, for verification and review to Oculus Lab. After uh, verification, they put directly to their uh, uh, a platform and spiral of words became available to uh, very wide uh, users all over the world. Of course, those users must uh, to use a specific uh, VR headset uh, because uh, we made our project for Oculus uh, uh, Quest uh, 2. Transformation of the spiral of words, a new media art project that took place in the early years of internet popularization and those have available to a small circle of audience and feel into deep oblivion due to the influx of information and data that overcomes our daily life. This early media artwork is adopted to, to VR technology and enrich itself with the new possibilities. The conceptual process is visualized and dynamic interaction in VR is achieved, which is now the uh, VR archiving available to one in, in a comparable wider audience. At the end of this presentation, I will show short video to uh, see how our uh, uh, archived project uh, look like.
Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm here. Thank you, Pedro. Um, I have a question. Uh, how long have you been going to ICEA? Remember that? Which was your first ICEA because you're all over the archives. <laughs> Uh, we put this project uh, on uh, Oculus uh, Store or Oculus App Lab, or today is called Meta Store, a couple of months ago. And we work on the, such a project uh, for, um, let's say, a couple of months. Okay. Uh, to prepare uh, uh, material to um, all uh, this uh, archive material to 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 uh, so possibilities what is uh, possible and what is the uh, new features in VR because VR is really media with uh, with a lot of possibilities that is not possible to be realized in a media of, of uh, uh, website or or uh, in our case of this uh, this work uh, via email. And um, that took a, a time for, for preparing material and then uh, programming and, and uh, uh, making uh, sound effects and other things. It's a much uh, shorter period of time. Mm -hmm. yeah. OK, thank you. Um, and th this project is widely available uh, through uh, the site. And you can also, from our website, you will see in preceding books, uh, uh, we publish uh, this uh, QR code. Everyone uh, could be uh, free to download uh, who has, uh, of course, uh, equipment for, for uh, VR, adequate mm -hmm. equipment. Okay, thank you. I find your work very poetic, I have to say. Um, is there another yeah. question? Otherwise, I want to say that Petra's work uh, will be a part of the art show that uh, is already visible downstairs. It's an online art show, so it will be on monitor. Um, and Petra will be uh, present um, after the artist talks that are after the lunch break. We have a number of short talks that uh, are artist talks, and then we have discussion with the uh, artists. Um, Petra will be uh, included in that discussion. Furthermore, I want to um, um, say that we have a few minutes, so that's why I uh, use, it, use it for a few announcements. My colleague Terry is uh, doing a survey for which he needs your cooperation, and he is telling you more about that at the end of this day, but I think that uh, a survey about new media art, but also a little bit about this summit, might be good to already think about it. And um, Terry is in conversation right now. And I wanted to ask him to say a few more words. So he's coming. In the meantime, we go back to the to the schedule and we were supposed to continue at exactly quarter past one. So we have a few minutes after Terry has said what he wants to say. Okay, um, I have a QR code here, here so I'll uh, pass it around. So if you could uh, please help me, uh, you know, to scan it and then uh, fill out the survey form. I, I'm doing research for the uh, connecting uh, Google archiving, uh, you know, uh, network, and I uh, would be greatly uh, appreciate if you could help me to. If you have the survey form, and it is also related to uh, the second summit on the media architecture. Thank you. More on that later. Yeah. Okay, then we have a little break. Um, our uh, 
did the next part of the program is the lightning talks. The people that give this, those lightning talks are ready to go. They're in their starting mic, so to speak. Uh, so sorry that we need no break. Uh, I've got to go to the toilet. Uh, lightning talks is a, 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 a format that is done by SIGGRAPH. The art department of SIGGRAPH, they have every month they have a session where artists give very short talks, presentations of their work. And somehow that's always very exciting. Because you never get bored. It goes from one to the other. And that's what we're doing here too. So uh, the first one is video taj from video taj from hong kong welcome yeah. hello can you guys hear me okay cool so um Hi everyone, I'm Shan, uh, the project coordinator from Video Touch, and here is John, my colleague, and we are so happy to be here to introduce uh, our archive CMAP. Uh, before talking about the archive, I would like to have a brief introduction about Video Touch. Uh, we are a nonprofit media arts organization from Hong Kong since 1986 and located in Cattle Depot uh, and Heritage Art Village. Video Media Arts Collection, FEMAT, was obfuscated in 2008. We represent more than 12 years of development in Hong Kong media arts. We have over 2,000 tapes, which included uh, video work, program, recording, movies, and over uh, 1,500 printed material in our FEMAT. And here are some pictures of our obsolete video machines, just to let you have a look. And we are ongoing to digitalize the video uh, documentation that we caught um, in our past uh, uh, 15, five, uh, 13, five years. So digitalization is one of our important mission in FEMAP. After digitalization, we will categorize them and then doing the uh, data entry and try to at doing the tagging. So we are not only digitalized the old format video as well, but we also uh, to digitalize the past program documentation. Uh, for the printed material, we digitalize the invitation cards, brochure, leaflet, uh, which provide a rich overview and structure to our past program. We also found some curatorial statement essay from the early 18th in Hong Kong. Uh, we can learn how they study uh, video arts from the uh, Western, Western country part in the days. Uh, this material show the trajectory of Hong Kong media art history, like what kind of subject, technology, issue uh, they are focused on and something like, yeah. And while, while we digitalize this material, we are also preparing an online archive uh, for the public. Our target audience, mostly from the university students and lecturers or researchers. And we would like to engage more people to get in touch with our archive through our online system. Uh, uh, through this different type of material, our ultimate goal is to contextualize the materials and make it more systematic. Uh, like uh, here, take Microwave Festival 1997, as an example, you can find our seminar uh, video documentation, a uh, uh, festival trailer, uh, screening preview, and then we have a brochure to provide the curatorial statement to give us an uh, overall structure to this festival. Uh, FEMA is not only preserve the old materials, we also keep acquired different videos to our archive. We collect the artwork which we find or we think that have the historical value. Also, we are keep expanding our collection to Asia Pacific. Uh, we have finished a series of collections from China and Taiwan and ongoing to collect artwork from Macau and Malaysia. Each time we invite an independent curator to give us advice about their local artists and history of video arts. Uh, we try to make 
uh, collaborative preservation on a bigger scale, uh, documenting wider picture of Asian media art history. We have published uh, Female's New Nest since last year. Uh, we will introduce a video work and a past program to the public. In this picture, uh, this is a microwave festival, 1997, that used CD room as uh, their study medium in this exhibition. Uh, and then we also invite some local researcher that make articles based from their assets in our collections. And of course, uh, besides all the acquisition and digitalization, uh, we have public programs that show our collection. Recently, we collaborate with Hong Kong West Kowloon Art District Amplus and Hong Kong Art Basel. Uh, the screening program show uh, our selected works by us and the curator. So yes, thank you guys for the listening. And then uh, tomorrow we have a panel discussion called Emerging Collaborative Presentation Project in Asia, which we invite uh, Ko John, uh, Kyle Chong, and Xu Wai to be our speaker and moderated by John and our the other uh, colleague, Myra. So yeah, that's all, thank you. Hi. Thank you for your presentation. I just have a quick question. I was wondering about the name of Weimar Pitzkopf, Video Tage. And I'm from Germany, and Video Tage means video days. I was just wondering if it has a meaning. Um, I don't know. What, what, why Video Tage? <laughs> Let me see. Uh, sorry, could you? Uh, we, I shall repeat my question. Yeah, sure. Can you hear me now? Hello. We are here. Yes, sorry, uh, we, we couldn't hear your questions. Can you repeat once, once yeah, again? Yeah. Just a quick question. I was wondering about uh, um, Vimex's name. What does it mean? Uh, why? Video target, or I don't know how it is pronounced because oh, in oh, okay. Five, uh, today, uh, yeah. and I was just curious. Video touch was uh, actually what one of the uh, one of the workshop uh, we hold uh, like over twenty years ago, and and uh, is is about is, is the name of video and montage. So uh, to combine the video touch, so that, that that's the original uh, idea of of the name of the workshop. Right. Yeah. I understand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Three, two, yeah, Is that all right? Show each other. My name is Ari Altsa. I'm not sure. Everything's fine there? Uh, yeah, it's this one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is one. Uh, yeah. The yeah, yeah. Take yes. a seat or I, take a Well, I'd rather okay. stand than uh, yeah. just, just five minutes. minutes. So, my name is Ari Altsa. I work for V2 Lab for the Instable Media in Rotterdam. And uh, Michel van Dartel, our director, is also here. He was sitting there. I just don't see him now. Um, so I will very quickly talk you to, through a few things that we are doing. Uh, V2 archive started in, not V2 archive started in 81, V2 started in 1981. So we have now 40 years of documentation. Um, so on our website, you can find uh, documentation of uh, 1400 events, a thousand works, 2000 persons and organizations, thousands of photos, 350 videos, and three, 600 longer texts, mostly PDFs, but also, I mean, not everything is uh, extensive. Some of the stuff is short, some of the stuff is long, um, and there's more, much more that's not on the website. So the question is a bit, uh, what is this archive and what is it for? I think it's in the first place, source material that uh, gives other people, art historians, students, just people who are interested uh, 
material to write their own histories of what has gone on in the past 40 years in the world of electronic art and everything around that. So an archive does not represent history, it possesses the potential for the writing of different histories. And this is interesting, I think, as well, because as an archivist uh, kind of uh, delving in my own archive, I always find new perspectives and stuff that I didn't know about, that I, that I kind of are taking on a new significance now, a significance that they might not have had back in 1982 or 2002. So this is what I think is uh, the value of the archive. So we strive to activate the archive also in order to make it something which is of value for us now, of value for students now, for young artists, artists of the future, um, a lot of people uh, just interested in this history of technology and art, and also the critics, the, let's say, critique that was inherent in this whole field of media art, the critique towards how we are shaped by technologies, uh, how our society has been shaped by these technologies. I think this, this is kind of what is. Yeah, one of the biggest values. So how do we do that? We do that by making new exhibitions that also like look at the past or uh, do reenactments of uh, all the works, have give artists uh, commissions to kind of dive into this history of uh, media art, technological art, electronic art, whatever you want to call it. And, uh, or like write new essays, make new works, make radio shows, and in that way also bring these di diversities of possible histories to a public. Um, so just a couple of quick examples. Um, we made a book for the electronic arts back 20 years ago. This was Arjen Mulder, Michael Post. Uh, book has become, well, in my field, a classic. Or I'm <laughs> talking from the Netherlands. Um, and um, let's say, um, yeah, the book I was um, circulating around is just a short version of kind of 40 years, a reflection of 40 years of history uh, of electronic art as it was happening at V2. And that's also where these images come from. Um, so reenactments, I mean, in 1990, 1979, 79, yes, Dick Leimarkus, a Dutch pioneer of, uh, well, a lot of different things, electronic music, made a performance a graphic method bicycle. We did a reenactment back in, what was it, 2008, actually remaking the hardware. Uh, Dick Marcus was still alive then. So that's an example of how to reactivate um, the archive. Uh, this is a really different one, a reenactment of Intona, um, sound piece by, um, uh, Dick Reimakers um, from 2001, I think, and DNK, from Dutch composers, performers, um, installation artists did their take on it. That was last year. Um, really recent, a couple of weeks ago, Mike Stenijs uh, had an exhibition um, with his research into touch interface and sending touch through the internet going back also to work of Norman White from 1986 that we had also already re-exhibited re at V2 in 2001, I think, and did a nice interview also with Norman White on all of the background uh, to that. Uh, an evening of the archive, this was in 20 January 2022, uh, video of that or the registration of that you can find uh, on the internet, on our website, and. YouTube and Vimeo channel. And then there's this book that I was just talking about, just exactly, and we do a radio show in which we always feature something from the archive. So that's it. Um, thank you very much for this question. Oh, one minute. Yeah. <laughs> if I can. <laughs> I mean, I'm yeah, just right. wanting you for one minute. Not one minute. Okay, yeah. okay. So, yeah. yeah. I have a different question. Go ahead. I love the you said that. I got, and that archiving uh, doesn't represent history. It's very interesting that there are a lot of artists that work in bands, like Dr. Webber. Say that. Yeah, I don't know this idea. Yes, it's just this. Oh, okay. It's just this. No. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, uh, just about the concept of your speech. 
uh, you said that an archive uh, doesn't represent history. I think it's very interesting. A lot of artists, contemporary artists, are working on that. Just like John von Huber, he said that he's a, a, an improbable or an archive yeah. is like the cave of the pigs. Yeah. So I think it's very interesting to think in your know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is a too large uh, subject to go into here. Uh, we need like a couple of hours and have to uh, but This is exactly, uh, so I think, the key, one of the key points uh, on this thing. about archiving. About archiving and also about the value of it. Uh, yeah, which uh, kind of tells you why, uh, yeah, why we are doing all this. And yeah, the book actually, the little book, if you want to have it, it's for free. So we have a couple more copies here. So please take them. I love stuff for free. The whole archive is Well, of course, it's not really for free, but now it's for free and it's been subsidized and we have like nice grants to be able to do that. Good, thank you very much. Shame on the show. <laughs> ah, this one, right? Uh, oh, perfect. <laughs> Here it is. Thank you. <laughs> you want a microphone? Or uh, stand I guess a microphone standing. Okay. <laughs> <That's> just... <laughs> you have to use the arrows. Oh, arrows. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, um, my name is Eric Contreras. I'm from uh, California in the United States. Uh, my university is uh, UC Davis, so University of California at Davis. I am um, a graduate student in the School of Design. My focus of research has mostly been in repurposing or creative reuse of obsolete technology. And through this craft, I've been coming across a lot of files uh, from obsolete uh, formats. So floppy disk, uh, I, I feel old saying it, but also CDs <laughs> and uh, mini disc as well. And uh, one thing I kind of noted, most of it was very uh, mundane uh, spreadsheets and, and uh, Excel documents, but every once in a while, there'd be very personal data that would be popping up. And I think especially now, as personal data is a hot topic uh, with uh, social media and the collection of it, there's that curiosity, it should we, archive this data of, of individuals, if there's any merit in doing that, or if it is just to, to dock at it. So I have just started in this research process. I'm curious on everyone's opinion going forward. So this is kind of a very open-ended uh, presentation. So uh, arrows, <laughs> uh, space, no, e. oh, uh, arrow up, no. Oh. <laughs> e. <laughs> so uh, this current collection has uh, three floppy disks. I call it a digital, digitized analog memory. So very personal files and uh, trying to find that human that human warmth in these kind of cold digital files as well. And so I've been contemplating best ways of curating this data. And the way I went about it was to use uh, a Windows 98 uh, PC, second edition. Uh, to create these desktop vignettes, so to try to create a desktop that would be mimicking um, the original creator of these files. And I think it kind of goes into some of the um, theory in, in exhibition design, such as like what color walls to use for an art exhibit. So it's very curious. Um, also the question of anonymity, uh, because these files are 20, 25 years old, so it's very likely that these individuals are uh, still present. So trying to find ways of presenting this work in a public space without being uh, a voyeuristic or to, no, no, uh, to, to disclose too much personal data. Um, so again, uh, just trying to explore this topic as I go forward. So these are gonna be the uh, files I'll be looking at, three floppy disks. They were found in uh, the San Francisco Bay area at secondhand shops. Um, very quickly. So there are two questions during this the, this act of, uh, of creation. So the first one has been, you know, is all personal data relevant uh, for archival, whether it's historic or for um, anthropological? So I, in the motivation for me, I feel it brings history alive to the 90s or 2000s. And I think as time goes by, it might be more important going forward. Uh, and then how much 
subjective flexibility should be given to the curator or the artist when using these these um, this data, uh, these files um, when when presenting it to a to a general uh, general public. And then finally, you know, how should the hardware that's capable of reading these formats be um, maintained for future use? Uh, so right now, I'm very we're very lucky. These uh, obsolete uh, computers uh, are easy to come by, but a hundred years later, this is going to be a, a very interesting task to, to, to dive into. So I'm trying to take full advantage uh, with the time that we're, we're working in. Um, so very quickly, uh, because of time, um, so I'll, three of these, one, oh, okay. <laughs> so the first one is a collection of uh, tourist photos of a, a choir at Sydney for 1997. Um, the next two I find is very um, impactful. One is a um, an expression or a, um, a diary entry of a troubled youth or reformed troubled youth and his experience in a uh, reform school. And again, it's that question as a curator, how much to disclose? Um, in addition to him saying is establishing his life turning around, he also is trying to have an IOD message. So trying to create a narrative. Again, are you, it, the question is, am I, creating the narrative or is it the files that are telling the story? So it's always very delicate balance. Um, again, a and then a, a short bio by a, a, a sixth generation, or sorry, fifth generation dentist who immigrated to the United States from, from China. Uh, so again, I think it's a story that's very interesting to kind of dive into. But again, <laughs> uh, we this. Thank you so much uh, for the time and Isaiah for hosting. Uh, it's been fantastic. Um, email uh, to reach me if, if there's any interest. I'm, I'm very interested to hear hear others' opinion on this topic. And if anyone knows of a uh, store in Barcelona that I can get floppy disks, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> Uh, we've got a lot of floppy disks yeah. and a large one, oh, the, the floppy. Yeah, uh, really floppy ones. Uh, I'll send them all to you because oh. <laughs> I, uh, I early Isaiah history. Oh, I'll text you all. Right. That sounds good. Okay, the next one will be uh, Sean and Sean about uh, computer exercise, I guess. Yes. Hello. Uh, yes, I'm Sean. <laughs> one of the Sean. Uh, I'm Sean Clark. Um, just let me share my screen and I'll begin our presentation. Okay, I'm hoping everyone can see that all right. Yep. Great. Um, okay, so I'm um, Sean Clark. I'm an artist um, and curator based in Leicester um, in the centre of the UK. And I'm here with my colleague, Sean Carroll, who's a PhD student at the Montford University, who's associated with this project. So the Computer Arts Archive um, is the sort of expanded new archives of the Computer Arts Society, which is a member-based organization that was established in 1968. Up um, until around, the, well, the work that had been collected by the society up until around about 2000, has actually mostly gone to the VNA in their main collections, their digital art collection. And I've been focusing really on collecting newer work, but also filling in some of the gaps that perhaps did not get passed over to the VNA in the, um, the first wave of the society. So very briefly, um, we are a Computer Arts Archive is a non-profit company that collects, exhibits and promotes computer arts for the benefit of artists, audiences, curators, educators, and researchers. We collaborate with other collections, museums, and galleries to explore the impact of digital culture and ensure that computer art is recognized as a significant contemporary art form with a rich and diverse history. In particular, we work closely with the Computer Art Society, a member-based organization founded in 1968. So that's our mission. We were set up as a community interest company, which in the UK is a type of non-profit. We set it up as a company so that any work donated to the um, archive would be protected. It wouldn't be sold or it wouldn't have a, um, be transferred over to a commercial interest. Uh, we were established in the year 2000, January 2020. 
And as I mentioned, we're based in Leicester, UK, and in particular, a building called the LCD Depot, although that is changing. Now, we had planned to launch in July 2020. That turned out to be not a particularly good idea. Obviously, the pandemic was in full flow then. So we're really only launching the project proper now. So two years late, but that's not necessarily a problem. I don't think it is going to affect our um, ultimate goals. And one thing that has happened over the last couple of years is that we've had a developing relationship with the Montford University here in Leicester. Um, one aspect of that is Sean Carroll doing his PhD in association with the archive. But it's also looking promising that we will have a university-based space to host the archive and ensure that it's looked after in um, good condition. So this is the LTB building that we're in at the moment. This is what the archive space is. As you can see, it's quite small as it's moving in. Um, and already we need more space. So that's one of the reasons we're talking to the Oxford University and other spaces as well. And we do have a website, computerartsarchive.com, which should be easy enough to find. So very briefly, because I know it's a short um, talk, I thought I'll explain our strategy for collecting. We're a, our core curated collection is what we call the CAS 50 collection. It was a collection of artworks brought together for exhibition to help celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Computer Arts Society. And that, those celebrations culminated in an event that we called Event 2 that took place at the Royal College of Arts um, in 2018. We collect artworks, but also books, catalogues, videos, DVDs, CD-ROMs. And we're particularly interested in digging deep into some of the untold stories surrounding digital arts and the development of digital arts, not just in the UK, but we're UK focused, but we're, we would like to work with artists elsewhere, obviously. And we're also offering a place where we can accept, if you like, legacy collections. So artists who, um, who passed away, their families want their work to go somewhere safe. And I'll, um, we've already got an, an outstanding collection of work in that, that field. And um, we also are interested in connected materials. So we want to be able to tell stories, narratives, and that would involve collecting materials that are connected to the artist, not necessarily artworks or even obvious um, ephemera. Um, the, the strategy at the moment is we're starting with printed works and we have around about 100 printed artworks from 44 artists at the moment. We then want to move up to collecting videos, screen-based works, um, screen-based works running on um, custom software and ultimately installation artworks. But I see the collection being found grounded in printed works and works that are easy to exhibit and transport and so on. But our ultimate goal is really to collect work of all sorts that's relevant to our own core goals. In terms of collecting ephemera, publications, books, reviews, that sort of thing, we have well over 100 books in our collection at the moment, um, associated ephemera such as catalogues, flyers and publicity materials. And then we're also generating and collecting documentary materials, doing interviews of artists and so on. Um, and ultimately we would like to collect algorithms and explanations of the artworks, particularly the early works where there's a risk of these being lost because obviously the computers that ran them are no longer um, available. So sure. final slide, our collections at the moment. Right. Uh, we have our core CAS 50 collection, which has worked from the 1960s to the present day, like I say, 100 or so framed works. We have a collection called MicroArts, which is work from the 1980s. That's currently being exhibited actually at the BCS, British Computer Society headquarters in London. If anybody is um, in London, wants to go and have a look at that. We have additional materials from the CAS archive that haven't gone to the VNA that we're collecting. We're collecting materials from the EVA conference, Electronic Visualization and the Arts, and we have their entire archive, a very large um, collection of boxes at the moment. And we've been talking about collecting the ICF Physical Archive, which is currently with Sue Golifer in Brighton. That should hopefully be finalized um, very, very soon. We have a lot of work relating to 1990s cyber culture and a legacy collection, if you like, from Edward Inatovich. Um, it's very good. And we're also collecting work relating to artists in our own area, Leicester Digital Artists. Sure. So hopefully sure. I haven't um, run over sure. too much, sure. but that is really sure. um, a summary of our archive project. <laughs>
your time is up, Sean. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, and that's me finished now. So yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, thank you. <laughs> yeah, the Computer, Computer Arts Society is of one of the, the oldest organizations in this field in the world from the time about the, the EAT. Uh, um, um, uh, initiative, uh, experiments, experimental, I forgot, it's, mm, sorry, confused. Um, <laughs> we only I, saw one, Sean, that uh, the, the... There's lots to talk about. I'd suggest people get in touch, and particular Sean Carroll is going to be around tomorrow as well. If anyone wants to make contact with us, please contact either of us. We'd love to talk with people. And the ISEA, as you could see on one of the slides, uh, the ISEA archives is starting a cooperation with this British archive as the new headquarters of ISEA will be close by to uh, both Sean's. And um, we look forward to that future. We have to go to the next uh, speaker because we are running out of time. Thank you, Sean and Sean. And the next uh, presentation will be by Martina Nedam from uh, the Netherlands, and she will tell, talk about her project. It's uh, your floor. Hello. So I'm Martina Nedam. I'm the author of the website Mouchette, and I'm going to a virtual character, and I'm going to, pre uh, to present a very special collection of found screen recordings so um, um so mouchette is a character that was uh, created in 19 a virtual character online virtual character created in 1996 the domain started in 1999 and um one characteristic of the site is that it has a very strange circulation, a lot of hidden link. For example, uh, here, if you want to visit it, like look for the links which are not uh, signaled by anything. And uh, it has a lot of interactive uh, part, like interactive narrative, and it preserves a lot of the reactions within these interactive narratives. So concerning screen recordings, um, I, I wouldn't say I make them to preserve the site. I preserve the site in many different ways. Sometimes I do use uh, screen recordings uh, as a default uh, situation. For example, if I have to make a presentation like this one, then it uh, helps. Uh, not to have to click and encounter uh, things, uh, unexpected things, because a lot of things should be unexpected. In Mouchet should be unexpected. Um, so um, what I preserve myself is the database and the interactive stories. So what, what the very special thing that happened and that I want to uh, show you today is um, a collection of screen recordings which have been found so unsolicited. Um, so, uh, and which are called, which I have sort of reintegrated as a part of the work of art. And, um, um, wait, wait, I'm going to stop that. So, and um, called Visions of Mouchette. So Visions of Mouchette is that collection. I made it, uh, that collection of screen recordings. So here is, uh, for example, Vika, uh, a young Russian girl uh, who is going to present her screen, uh, what she has recorded. And in that website, you have a collection of about, uh, 15 different screen recordings which were found online, uh, mostly by Russian uh, kids, Russian young people. Uh, I have, um, I have, uh, so they were found by Nikos Voyatsis. I have been documenting them together with uh, Nikos Voyatsis. 
uh, that is uh, identify exactly what they were made of, uh, how they were made. So, and uh, all the technical data and everything. And I have um, made, I have got uh, professional uh, translation uh, subtitles made and I'm integrating them as uh, as a, a screen recording, as a part of the work of art. In fact, they became the work of art here. It's not called Visions of Mouchette Org, but it's called Visions of Me. They are presented by uh, Mouchette herself. So what's, what's really uh, amazing is that they were unsolicited, uh, that the, in certain cases, they, uh, for example, it's very nice to see that girl showing a very uh, all kind of uh, expression, what she feels, what she thinks. In the case of interactive, of course, the um, interaction, the ideal is to have the version of the ones who interact. Uh, and in that case, it's even an unsolicited version because they mix it with their own imaginary, with their own stories. So, um, here I'm, I'm going to show you. So this is this is uh, the Mouchette, the, the real archival, because this uh, visions of Mouchette, I don't call it an archival, I call it a part of the work of art. Uh, so for example, another very Sorry for work of art. Can you wrap up uh, your presentation? The time is up. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, there, you, there it is. You can go to visit. Uh, you can go to visit uh, uh, Visions of Mouchette and see the, um, let me unshare my screen. Uh, Thank you, Martina. A very interesting project from yeah. a logical point of view, at least. And I think it's, it's um, uh, it, it invites yeah. reactions so people may go to your website and maybe contact you and um, because it's, a, it's an invitation for that, in my opinion. Um, the next speaker comes to us from the United States, or it must be early in the morning, I guess. And her name is Kalani Nicole, or the other way around. Okay, hi, um, my name is Kalani Nicole. I am a technologist and I make software. I'm also the founder of an experimental media art gallery called Transfer. Um, I have been exploring decentralized networks and virtual worlds in contemporary art for more than a decade now. And I'm gonna share with you some of my experiments in distributed networks of care. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about participatory preservation over the years. Um, before I get started, I just wanna send a special thank you to Bonnie Mitchell, who really held my hand through this process. It's my first time presenting at an academic conference. And I'm so honored to um, share my work with you all. I really appreciate the work that you all do. Um, so I just want to start sharing a little bit about Transfer. It was founded in Brooklyn in 2013 to show computer-based practices. And the conceit of the gallery was to think about solo exhibitions. So really working with one artist at a time, focusing on giving over the full space. Um, the exhibitions really transform the space with every show. So it's less of a white cube, it's more of a holodeck. Um, and first and foremost, we thought about exhibition and what it meant to use space and place to activate work to bring new audiences together. We also thought a lot about architecture in the space. So, um, you know, first and foremost, what does it mean to exhibit a work to really move it away from the screen and put it in contact with a viewer? Um, and how can we use new technologies to think about new ways of working? Um, a lot of what started happening at Transfer was thinking about um, repositories and works and iterative work. So how could I show something that was sort of early on in the process um, and sort of this hybrid design thinking methodology where it's okay to fail. That's what we do in technology. We test and learn 
and iterate? And how can we bring some of that and align that with the sort of custodial care long view thinking in the contemporary art world? Um, so a lot of what was happening was about iteration. It was also talking about what it means to live with a work of art and how you can think about uh, dwelling with time-based media work, um, what it means to really care for the work. So there was much experimentation in the gallery, um, also created new kinds of formats. Um, and this is a case study, I think, which was really interesting where I started to think about um, preservation in a different way. Um, so this is the transfer download. It's a traveling catalog of artwork. Um, and essentially you come into this room and there's an iPad selector that allows you to choose from a huge list of works. Um, so it allowed me to take a bunch of different formats, whether it was virtual reality, animated GIFs, generative art, and create one consistent presentation format. So the works maintained their diversity, their complexity, but the presentation had this sort of simplicity. It was a prompt to the artist to create sort of a derivation of their work and think about that as one of the many iterations of a work. Um, so this also allowed me to um, do collaborations with institutions where I was going into new partnership relationships, into new contexts, and having these conversations about the varied formats of media art and sort of making that sort of depth of conservation cool. It was part of what was happening in the, in the download, um, which led me to this experiment called The Current in 2018. Um, to again continue to expand these conversations about different formats of media art and what it means to care for them and tend to them. Um, so I'm sorry, my presentation seems to be a little frozen here. Um, uh, the way that this worked is we did these beautiful installations in a home-like environment so people could immediately start to envision what it might be like to live with a work of art. As you entered, you got a folio. You can see one here on the um, desk. Uh, and it's essentially all the information about what it will take to care for the work, to tend for the work, the costs, talking to conservators ahead of time, presenting all that information, and talking about you know, what the implications are to really bring on a work um, into a collection. Uh, you you then got to receive a, a vote on the work. Um, am I out of time? One minute. One minute. Okay, thanks for the warning. Uh, and we also experimented with things like um, giving a um, preview copy, a, a sort of private exhibition copy. So instead of going to the museum, the museum came to you. And we also set a NAS drive in the homes of our members. And that kind of distributed um, stewardship was something that really took off. And it's an idea that I think has a lot of strength. So this is what I'm working on now. It's a transfer archive, transfers turning 10 years. So I'm focusing my energy on looking back. And I have this idea for a new peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure. Came out of a lot of ideas based on this exhibition, piecesofme.online. If you'd like to see that, it's still online. Um, and this is about bringing a new level of conservation and care into the space of um, blockchain technologies um, and thinking about new ways to use Web3 to empower artists, employ solidarity model principles around creating a community of care from the studios, but also from the organizations and supporters that um, bring together work. Um, so I'm just going to end my presentation with an invitation to you all. EAT was just mentioned previously. Um, I'm now uh, leading sort of a new salon series. It kicks off on June 21st. It's hybrid, virtual, and physical. Um, and it's reflecting on sort of all of the history since um, EAT was founded through to today um, and thinking about how institutions can um, come together and think about preservation across audiences and getting more and more people excited about the history of media art um, and tending to its future. So I uh, will end there and thank you all so much. Or the microphone. Yes. Thank you very much, Nicole, or should I say Kalani? Kalani, yes. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, it's Bonnie who kept all the contacts with all the speakers. So I'm a little bit out of it. We have a few minutes. Um, to uh, discuss uh, the, the uh, lightning talks. And um, Anthony is trying to get them all back in. in. So we have them in a row there. And um, I'm sure that somebody this time has some questions that maybe addresses all of these lightning talks somehow.
I invite general questions. Uh, if nobody has any, then particular questions to particular people. We have at least four, and we have uh, um, Ali also here. Ali, I don't pretend to the front, makes it all more cozy. Questions? You will have your lunch break soon after this, so yes. Eric, you have to, Eric, why don't you come up to the front? Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, oh sorry, sorry. sorry. Mm -hmm. Good, good, good. Let's wait for Eric to join the table, and I'll give you the microphone. Okay. Go, Eric. Yes, thank you. Now, I didn't hear the first uh, two presentations, actually, so I just want to <laughs> make that clear. Um, so what's in the air? I think the big question I want to ask is, do you see, how do you see this tapping into uh, an existing professional archive work of big museums, curators, all this. I mean, I, what I see is a lot of very nice growth layer initiatives. Uh, I work on those myself, and I really love that. But is that the answer then, that we should tap into this big world of museums and curators going into those kind of archives, or are we pointing out a new world of uh, a global archiving system. What what tick 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 uh, institutional relations, uh, where money comes from. Uh, the only thing I could add here is that in the Netherlands we have now a network, Network Archive Design Digital Culture, Network Archives Design Digital Culture, uh, which is a network of various organizations that have documentation of media art, but also design, also typography, also all those types of digital culture, uh, for which there is basically no money, no official government money put into really the archiving of that. So what we run into at the two, but I think that's a, uh, a different organization is saying, is that we do have money to make presentations and we do have sometimes a little bit of grants to bring our archiving efforts to the public but there is basically everything that we do in terms of archiving needs to come from our basic subsidy, which is not uh, meant to be spent on archiving. No, but at um, least you got some subsidy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, yeah, um, no, but I mean, to, to, to go further into that, so we have now this network uh, to kind of get those organizations together in order to make our case there and in order also to bring to the or from that also the archive so keeping this stuff costs us money and uh, costs us lots of time basically uh, in terms of just people working on it and maintaining it but also adding to it so uh, yeah i don't have a really answer no, no. so to your, I, to your real I, question but i mean we also try to get into a collaboration with this i don't think it's a larger world um, but this other this the world of media or of academic um, um, networks like Claria in, in the Netherlands. I, I, I'd exactly. like to to say a few words about this question. Also, but first, I'd like to know no. from videotage uh, whether they had uh, ideas about this or or questions or you know it is. One of the reasons why they're organizing these summits, and especially Oliver Grau's uh, perspective on this, who is one of the uh, initiators of, uh, you, he's not here yet, but he'll be here later, uh, of ADA in, uh, in uh, Austria, the Archive of Digital Art. <coughs> By the way, I've, I remember that each stood for its experiments in art and technology. That's by the way, 
Um, so video ties, do you have ideas about this uh, connecting all these initiatives that we have worldwide and that we try to sort of bring together via this summit? What's the, what should be, what, what would be the future of this in your um, opinion? How would you like it? I, I might even um, say. Well, uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, we, yeah, we totally understand the challenge of uh, the media art preservation, especially uh, for the sake of uh, funding and resource uh, uh, as a really a relatively small uh, arts organization in Hong Kong, which is uh, we only have uh, the concept of media art preservation over the just uh, beginning over the, the, the last few years. So uh, we as an archive, uh, developed early, uh, we, we have uh, a good resource funding from the government so to, to, to uh, do all kinds of uh, activities for the, the preservation for, for our collections. But uh, we think uh, the purpose of holding the summit like today is especially crucial to the, uh, the field of uh, arts archiving and media art archiving, especially uh, if for the example of our field of uh, video art archiving, uh, the magnetic tapes, uh, especially, um, they, are, they are going extinct within the 10 years. So uh, it is good that we can have this kind of conversations uh, uh, with all of us and to have, uh, um, to share mindset and concept as in a collaborative way so we can like have a understanding of each other practice to, you know, in order to link and link the thoughts of our past history together. Yes. I, I, yeah, yeah. Thank you, that's a good, good reply. Eric, the last words? Oh, no. No, <laughs> uh, no I just graduated, right. so. <laughs> You're standing here. No, <laughs> um, <laughs> enjoying <okay>. myself. <laughs> yeah, we have a, a half hour lunch break, but Bonnie is going to say something uh, more encouraging. That was an excellent question. And I hope we can all address it at 6.40 today at the round table. Okay, on connecting archives worldwide. So with that, let's have lunch and come back in an hour and a half at uh, looks like 3.30. We have some really exciting presentations. So invite people back. We'll see you at 3.30. Thank you, everyone. Well, I knew that before. I was Antonio. Antonio. Yes.